My name is Deborah Kern and I work in the Faculty of Law at the University of Victoria and I'm pleased to welcome you to the fifth year of the City Talks here in Victoria. Uh, we are organized or we are part of the Committee for Urban Studies which is a group of scholars from faculties and departments across campus and we're supported by a grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council as well as funding for many departments and faculties on campus. Um, before I introduce Jeff, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the Coast Salish peoples on whose traditional territory we are welcomed, and they certainly in particular welcome the University of Victoria and activities by the University of Victoria. The theme for this uh, fall's City Talks, which are, uh, we give three talks per term, so it's usually the third Thursday of the month if we're able to, um, the people that we want to come talk, if they're, we're able to slot them into the third Thursday and it's worked out for this fall. Uh, the theme for this fall is environmental justice. And what we mean by environmental justice very broadly, although I think Jeff will take issue with it, which is uh, welcome, is that we recognize that the negative impacts, particularly the health impacts, felt by human populations from environmental harm is disproportionately experienced by marginalized and racialized communities. And this is certainly well documented in the United States, but it's not as um, avidly talked about and certainly from what I deal with in law and policy it's not as well recognized in Canada um, so and that is why then we have this focus for the fall so not only the question of why is it that we aren't as focused on it here in Canada or what are the forms that we are focused on in Canada and how do we express that so in September we invited Dana Scott from the Osgoode Hall Law School and she spoke about ecological citizenship and the impact of our individual choices, in particular on marginalized communities and the way that that plays out through our purchasing habits and the way in which we live. Uh, we have Jeff tonight and I'll introduce him. And in a month's time on November 20th, we have Julie C. from the University of California at Davis on November 20th. And she has done extensive work on environmental justice in the United States. And now she's focusing on, Canada, or on um, China. Sorry. The theme, just before I turn to Jeff, for the spring is racism, memory, and politics in the European city. So without further ado, let me introduce Jeff Masuda, who has traveled uh, from Kingston in Ontario to be with us tonight and for the last few days. Jeff is cross-appointed in the School of Kinesiology and Health Studies, and I'm sorry, in School of Kinesiology and Health Studies and the Department of Geography at Queen's University. And as of today, we're able to publicly say that he is the Canada Research Chair in Environmental Health Equity. So it has been released from its embargo. So congratulations, guys. Uh, he founded the Center for Environmental Health Equity and where he continues to serve as a director. Jeff is a human geographer, trained in health geography and the interdisciplinary fields of health promotion and population health. He uses community-based participatory research approaches to investigate the systemic roots of social and environmental justice. He publishes widely in the areas of environmental health promotion, citizen engagement in regional environmental governance, risk, and urban environmental justice. And I think what you'll hear about tonight are several of the very interesting projects that he's involved with right now. Uh, some of them involve promoting improved environmental determinants of health for low-income tenants, uh, disability, climate change, and fossil fuel ableism. I think you'll hear a little bit about perhaps um, uh, the Japanese Canadian internment or the modern day effects of that, indigenous communities in the downtown east side, and um, what's been happening at Oppenheimer Tar Park in Vancouver. So his talk tonight is titled, Does Environmental Justice Work for Urban Health Inequities in Canada? And please join me in welcoming Jeff Masuda. Thanks for the warm welcome, everybody. Um, I'll just say off the, bat, off the bat, I've got this really annoying lingering sort of frog in my throat that's causing me to cough from time to time, so I'm going to drink lots of water to minimize that so that the good folks that watch this on video in the future are going to just hear me coughing for a few quarters of an hour. <laughs> I'll keep hydrated. <clears throat> so it's an honor to, to, to speak about tonight's subject, environmental justice, on the traditional lands of the families of many Coast Salish nations here. It's also the land where my own ancestors once aspired to build a life. And so it's always nice to come back home, so to speak, in that sense. 
Uh, thanks and my compliments to the organizers of the City Talks. This is a fantastic model that you have to do these kinds of uh, public uh, discussions about uh, issues about the city. And I definitely will be emulating or stealing the model at some point in the future and maybe trying something like this uh, in Ontario. Uh, and thank you, audience, for, for coming tonight. Uh, 7.30 is a little bit of an unorthodox time for, to come and hear someone yap at me for 45 minutes to an hour, but that's uh, so why I appreciate that, and I hope that I can keep you interested, if not entertained. <coughs> so this picture here, pictures are worth a thousand words, and a thousand words here is, you know, this is pretty good imagery to sort of capture the essence of what we mean by environmental justice, or environmental injustice. But it's also a very appropriate picture, because it's, as you can see by the Maybe you can't in the back, but at the bottom it says, report one out of four New Yorkers live near a toxic site. And so the American context of this, of this imagery, I think, is salient to tonight's discussion that I'm going to try to hope, that I hope to, to broach, which is, is this thing that we call environmental justice relevant in the Canadian context? And I have to confess, when I was asked to speak on the subject, uh, I'm a little bit on the fence about this question that, that I've posed in this title. And the work that I'm going to present tonight is, is material that, I've, that I have worked with for the past number of years, but, uh, but have moved away from a little bit. And so at first I was feeling a little bit reluctant, uh, but given the opportunity to revisit some of the old research and think through some of the things that I was thinking about at the time when I did this research, it's really been useful for me to realize that, you know, perhaps, uh, perhaps it's worth a little bit more thought. And so I've given it some more thought and maybe updated and refreshed some of the things that I was thinking about and that you'll find in the, public, the published work that I've written. And there'll be a reference list at the end of the, at the, end of the talk. Um, I'll try to drink after every slide. I always forget to do that. <clears throat> Before we can put environmental justice to work, it's useful to spend some time to get a sense of what it is and how it's supposed to work. So we'll start with, because I am an academic, we'll start with a pop quiz. By a show of hands, answer the following question. Environmental justice is a legal concept. Of course, the lawyer, an activist movement. Some hands, an academic theory. And a policy objective. Some Americans in the room, perhaps. Uh, a human aspiration. There we go. And of course the correct answer is F, all of the above, but uh, for those of you that have ever done optical machine scoring, there is rarely an F. Uh, <coughs> so the, the answer, the other answer is that environmental justice is really a can of worms. It's, it's, there's a lot more worms than the five that I've listed here when we talk about this, this idea. The history of environmental justice goes back a ways, and I'll talk, I'll broach that history a little bit tonight. But it's really shown that it's the wild E. Coyote of concepts, always conjuring up new ways to chase after and attain this elusive prize, this thing called justice, whatever that means. <coughs> and of course, like wily e. Coyote, never really gaining a taste of that prize, but always confident that it would probably taste pretty good. So one day we might find it coming up in a legal clinic and an international conference, public lecture, sharing circle, uh, yet another perhaps government policy in some jurisdictions, although to date not yet in Canada, as Deborah alluded to. And I think that it, this sounds like a little bit of a slippery concept, but I think it's a good thing it's necessarily this way. The idea of environmental justice is really an intersectoral effort. It's not just about it's not just about requiring the inclusion of many different perspectives, but it demands an alignment of, among them, drawing on the capabilities of each of these disciplines or ways of knowing uh, toward a shared and often seemingly unattainable objective. And often we find ourselves working in spaces and using language that may be discomforting to those of us that subscribe to sort of singular professional or disciplinary or activist uh, endeavors. 
But before we dig down, it may be worth thinking about what environmental justice is at the surface level, the sort of the basics, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> because sometimes it's the surface. Oops. That's just the funny. Mm -hmm. I don't. I can't see my own slides here, so I don't know. Um, there we go. Sometimes we tend to be hard on surface level thinking, but it can also be uh, a good starting point, I think, for a conversation. And quintessentially, environmental justice is a, a very universal idea. The idea that a healthy environment is in everybody's best interest. It's pretty easy to you know, wrap your mind around that idea. Because of this, working to assure that we all have the opportunity to live in a healthy environment is both morally and ethically good, and therefore just. Also, easy to wrap your mind around. Environmental justice is both an end an endpoint. Sometimes that's a very practical thing, like reducing pollution. Sometimes it's more of an idealist endpoint. But it's also much more than an end. It's a means to that end, to pursue justice or to seek justice. Whether that means is protest, legal proceeding, research, policy, or perhaps even a vision or a dream. But while I would make no preemptive claims about which of the specific means is any more or less effective, what is easy to see is that there is no universalism in how <coughs> we go about seeking justice. So here are two very purposively selected different versions or definitions of environmental justice that try to focus on how it works, how it's supposed to work. And you'll see some of my bias in terms of which definition I subscribe to. <coughs> so one is from the top, so-called top, and this comes from the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, and they say it's a fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, Im implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. It's the other side, on the right here, the definition which derives from my reading of critical interdisciplinary studies of environmental justice suggests a bit of a different view than that one from the bottom. A critical and systemic response to social and political structures and processes that have treated vulnerable populations unfairly or that have resulted in their underrepresentation in various approaches to environmental governance. Also a bit of a mouthful, I must say. On first glance, we see a lot, of, a lot in common between these two approaches. Both are process-focused, like I said, they lean heavily on the interest and the agency of so-called vulnerable groups. Uh, they want them to be more central in decisions that affect our collective lives. But there is also a very wide and important distinction to be made. There's a gulf between these two approaches. And what it boils down to is semantics. Who is the subject and object in these two definitions? On the one side, we have, and I've highlighted them, Involvement. We involve people in policies, and it suggests that justice is the responsibility of those who make the decisions. The decision maker is the subject, and the people of color are the object. We will involve them. And on the other side, the response of those same people from their self identified underrepresentation or exclusion from decision making suggests or demands that they take control of the situation and target the decision-making table itself as the source of injustice. So they become the subject. And the object here are those responsible for injustice. We, the people, will respond to them, the perpetrators. <coughs> and note additionally the distinction between the more formal and limited sense of decision-making at the top. The deference is given to this idea that better communication or inclusion will result in policies that address people's concerns. It sort of sweeps up citizens' concerns into this deliberative process. But from below, the other definition, the broader notion of governance, lends support to the view that better decisions don't just come from within a system, but that the system itself has been shown time and time again to respond very quickly and often effectively when there's pressure from the outside. So that's a crucial distinction when it comes to the present task that we have of thinking about a justice-based approach to urban governance, particularly as it affects health. 
So at the risk of beating a semantic horse to death, what we have here is the difference between a more inclusionary, incrementalist approach to justice and a more transformative movement. But what I'm not saying is whether or not these approaches are mutually exclusive. And I don't necessarily think that they have to be. The history of environmental justice tells us, in fact, that the version on the left is an outcome of the successful implementation of the movement that's happened on the right. And I'll elaborate on that in a moment. So the message to take forward from this comparison is the idea that it's important to recognize that citizen-driven mobilizations are the real drivers of social and political change. And we, in, qu in quotes, and I re refer to a narrow sense of we, for those of us in the room that would be researchers or, or other sort of professionals that engage with these ideas, we should take, uh, think about taking let's go ahead again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, a supportive and subordinate role in their agendas and not the other way around. And so that is the, the essence of this idea of justice-driven research, which is what I want to present to you tonight. And it's a little bit different than research that's about injustices, which is an entirely different thing. <coughs> so to set the stage here, here's a little bit of history that helps us to understand where the idea of environmental justice comes from. And the story that I'm going to tell, like all stories, is a partial one. And for better or worse, it's very American in flavor. But it's a good story, not because it's particularly unique, but perhaps because this is the story that first gave us the language, or a lot of the language that we presently use to talk about and act upon environmental justice and injustice in the ways that we do. So this photo is a famous photo that depicts the emblematic case of a civil disobedience campaign that happened in Warren County, North Carolina in 1982, <coughs> uh, in, in which a, a predominantly African-American community centered in the town of Afton aimed to put a stop to a PCB landfill that was uh, sited in the, in, within their vicinity. And what makes this story unjust is twofold. First, and intuitively, the community had nothing to do with the PCBs themselves. The PCBs were the, were the product of a, an illegal roadside dumping by a trucking company uh, whose owner was duly uh, convicted and imprisoned for their misdeed of dumping some about 30,000, uh, I guess, gallons of PCBs onto the side of the road on rural roads throughout the state, uh, <clears throat> rather than paying, the mandatory, paying for the mandatory process of recycling, which he was supposed to do, he just dumped the stuff out on the roadside. But the fact that the state govern government came to the decision to dump the contaminated soil in Warren County, that was the main source of contention for this community, particularly since the decision came from the top, without a single opportunity for local input into the decision, nor very much consideration of the consequences. And moreover, in the early days, there was no accompanying rhetoric about perhaps there might be some local economic benefits, maybe we can hire some people things that we hear about a lot more now, and mainly because there was no resistance expected. In fact, as later research carried out in the wake of this conflict proved, Warren County was in fact a very typical case. This was not an egregious and exceptional violation of this community's rights, but this was happening all the time, everywhere, all over the country, and research uh, was done and brought that to bear, and it, and it led to the movement that we now know today is the environmental justice movement. And so this was a, a deeply central and problematic new chapter in the civil rights movement and the, the broader American story about the original sin. The second injustice, though, in this case that's less publicized and less valorized uh, is that while this was emblematic in launching a movement, the outcome for this community was pretty much unsuccessful. Uh, the dump was located in Warren County with very predictable consequences. Exacerbated stigma, uh, there were technological design flaws and contamination, and a continuing socioeconomic marginalization of this community. All of that happened, and the community suffered the consequences for decades. But on the plus side, the, the case did prompt a lot of scientific interest, 
uh, in the U.S. around the relationship between toxic facility siting, pollution, and race. That became the movement that we talk about today. But what we're more concerned about tonight is what is the Canadian story, or is there a Canadian story? One part of the story that we hear a lot, for those of us that think about environmental justice, is that there is this uh, sensible lack of discussion about environmental justice in Canada altogether both in general and in the specific context of environmental justice in, in the urban context. And I think the story, the arguments in the story fall along three lines. <coughs> the first is that it has to do with our comparatively benign history of civil rights activism. Many have argued that there is no equivalent Canadian counterpart to the scale of the civil rights movement in the United States and therefore no opportunity to harness and redirect the attention of what at the time was a, a, a very mature environmental movement. The second argument against environmental justice in Canada is that the urban form of Canadian cities does not lend itself to obvious cases of environmental inequality. We are less starkly racially divided and politically polarized. Our cities are multicultural and they're spatially complex creatures. And the third is that a more consensus-based society, in contrast, to our hyper-litigious neighbors to the south makes legalistic notions of justice just a little bit too abrasive for our sensitive ears. We prefer to think in terms of equity and inclusion and perhaps more begrudgingly tolerance. So to these arguments, the abstract that you may have read suggested simply that's all hogwash. On the other hand, the picture that I painted is a bit of a straw man. Just because one story is told in some places doesn't mean it's the only story. And so here, events of recent years proves that there are many other stories to tell about environmental justice in Canada. And it may be that Canadians simply weren't ready at the time for environmental justice in the 1980s. We are perhaps just a little late to the party. So one case in point which I show here, and in fact, I believe a previous presenter showed uh, the same image uh, in their talk, which is interesting because it proves my point. Uh, this image uh, of a CN rail blockade at Amjanong First Nation in, in late 2012 has the potential to be as emblematic as the image that I showed you about Warren County in influencing a new wave of environmental justice that's uh, prompted by and is part of the discourse of Idle No More. The symbolic parallel to the U.S. story was that the blockade here at Amjanon had a very practical but short-lived effect of putting a temporary halt to the shipment of petrochemicals into Chemical Valley and Sarnia. But the deeper similarity was that this mobilization of one small First Nations community was only their latest act of resilience in the face of many years of health risks <clears throat> associated with the massive petrochemical industrial sector that grew around Amjanon over the past 50 years. But even this speaks to only one instance of Canada's own uh, original sin. That is the long history we have, the long legacy of colonialism, racial prejudice, and the persistent abrogation of government in its constitutional responsibilities to Indigenous people in Canada. And perhaps the third level of similarity for Canada is alluded to in this quote by Robert Lovelace. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote these words in 2008 from prison after being convicted for contempt of court coming out of his participation in protests against a mining company called Frontenac Ventures uh, that was proposing to mine on Aboriginal lands uh, near Charlotte Lake. And as in the US, there's been an intimate relationship between academic and activist orientations within the Canadian environmental justice movement. And so this is something that I've been observing in my own interactions with scholars and activists across this country, including many academics who've contributed uh, to helping to understand what's going on in Amjanon. And so such forms of activist research alliances are promising examples of the utility of environmental justice as an effective instrument in bringing together Canadian environmentalism with Indigenous and social justice activism. <coughs> we now have a decent body of uniquely Canadian contributions to environmental justice 
both in general and in the context of the urban. Uh, Andal Gosain and Cheryl Tiluxing, uh, Cheryl is a colleague of mine, their work has been very influential on me in thinking a lot more about the role of science and professional knowledge more broadly in producing the environment as well as constraining the way we think about uh, its relationship to our humanity. Environmental science often talks in the language of, in, of risk uh, and it treats values as rest, less relevant. Environmentalism and environmentalists, for their part, have typically, uh, uh, historically, a tendency to construct a nature, a form of nature as distant, as a distant non-human other and that alienates us from our shared experiences and responsibilities in the world along the way producing a form of nature that's very class dependent and that benefits the affluent while often blaming the poor for their ostensible lack of care about the environment. Their argument is that a plurality of knowledge, often from below or outside of the valorized realm of science and mainstream environmentalism, can contribute to a better appreciation of the root causes of environmental injustice. So I use the images that you see here, I like these when I teach about environmental justice because they quite effectively drill into the core values that many students hold as Canadians. <coughs> it depicts the critical artwork of pre-artist Kent Monkman that disrupts this notion of the empty white Canadian landscape imagery that's very prominent in Group of Seven painting. In the image below, which is an obvious, uh, you can see where he's going with it, uh, it's called Superior. Uh, the, image, the imagery happens to be on, on about Lake Superior. But the use of the, of the title Superior is, it has a double meaning, I suppose. But what we see in this one, or at least what I see, is white nature being defaced with homoerotic graffiti. Meanwhile, the stump itself becomes a phallus that passively stands by as the stereotypical chief assaults the cowboy. And in so doing, annihilates the sort of masculinist hero status of the classic Western narrative and affirming indigenous agency within the Canadian landscape. In forming my own work, I've been particularly attracted to the ways in which environmental justice helps us to repopulate the environment, to put us back into uh, the environment, shifting the emphasis of environmental discourse beyond compromised ecologies and contaminated bodies towards a broader notion of an environment that has a lot more to do with our everyday lives. And this excerpt is from a paper that I co-authored with a colleague that sums up my enthusiasm for environmental justice in my own work, which has primarily been in the urban context. <coughs> so this idea takes us full circle to the impetus behind environmental justice as a movement as a whole, that is to make environmentalism more inclusive and more encompassing. This quote here is taken from a 20-year retrospective account of the environmental justice movement in the United States, and it basically encapsulates, I think, where we need to go with this. Uh, it's the environmental justice movement is as much concerned about the environment as any of the traditional environmental groups. There is only one environment. The environmental justice movement is concerned about wetlands, birds, and wilderness areas. It's also concerned about urban habitats, reservations, things happening on the U.S.-Mexican border, children poisoned by lead uh, in their own homes, and about children playing in contaminated parks and playgrounds. So that really segues nicely. In the context of the urban, I suspect that most people in this room will not find it all that challenging to understand the relevance of environmental justice as an appropriate lens or tool to work on cities. But I think we can be sometimes uh, challenged by onlookers when we try to call for an environment-centric approach to urban issues, where the concerns of families, concerns are of families caught up in the struggle against inequality, poverty, housing, food insecurity, and displacement. All of these tend to be framed from, as a broader phenomenon of social injustice. <coughs> I have two responses to this. First is to think less about environmental justice in the city as thinking about the city itself as a more or less just thing. It's to shift from asking how polluted is our city to asking 
what is a city? The distinction is to focus less about the risks in urban space, things like air pollution, water pollution, and so on, and more about urban space itself and how that space is produced, including the process of urbanization and change, as these things as being unjust when it takes when it makes life more, or sorry, better for some people at the expense of others who tend to become worse off as a result of these changes. And this leads to the second response, which is to embrace a broader and non-causational view of environment as an influence on the health of urban inhabitants. It is to ask, what is health? Stepping away from the conventional binary analysis of singular environmental risks and physical health outcomes, we can remind ourselves to think of the urban as our home. We have built this for ourselves. In this way, the environment and environmental justice encompasses all facets of a healthy life, from the physical to the emotional. physical, emotional, social, cultural, economic, and even the political. Thus, the issues to be tackled transcend the need for cleaner air and water and soil and so on, as important as these things are. We might construe, additionally, the deficit of recreational opportunities, the paucity of, of access to resources to help the community to be more inclusive, the rising costs of food, housing, and other everyday needs that we all have as all being environmental issues. <clears throat> In this way, what constitutes environmental injustice includes the full range of material and social deprivations that result in compromised urban life. And environmental justice is fundamentally about what kind of city can we achieve. So this is a more holistic way of understanding the urban experience, which tends to be fragmented into myriad issues to be solved in isolation from each other, when all are so obviously related to each other. And so uh, I'm going to offer a few ideas that I've grappled with that lend some insight into how to go about investigating what's going on in cities from the perspective of urban inhabitants who have experienced environmental injustice themselves. And these are examples of what we might call or the questions that we can ask through this justice-driven research approach. <coughs> the first is that we might examine a phenomenon I'll call participatory destruction. And this is the idea that we can see many instances where urbanization itself authorizes the creative destruction of people's homes and livelihoods. This is the idea of accumulation by dispossession, argued by geographer David Harvey. But what's worse about this concept is the ways that such authorization often enrolls the very people whose homes are destroyed in the process. These processes that endeavor to justify such destru destruction as somehow being just benign side effects for the greater good of the city. This approach confronts the subversive purposes behind ostensibly democratic instruments of public consultation in urban governance as amounting to little more than techniques for delimiting not just what people are allowed to talk about, mm -hmm. but also how they can talk, mm -hmm. including what features are up for discussion mm -hmm. and what are not, and what language participants mm -hmm. should be speaking in such discussions. And the example in the, the imagery that you see here uh, points to the regulatory regimes that allow for the bulldozing of established low-income neighborhoods like this one in Hamilton, Ontario, in the north end of that city. In this case, a combination of crude zoning legacies, chronic neighborhood disinvestment, creative political land swapping, and tokenistic participatory environmental assessment allowed for the annihilation of a previously intact neighborhood called Oliver via the replacement of a community park, which you see on the left, a uh, photo from the 1970s, with a biodiesel uh, production facility. So that same space, uh, photos taken on the right by me around 2007. 
So what the discussion entailed was ideas of economic prosperity for Ontario, negligible air pollution and facility impacts. This was the language of the discussion. What was not open for discussion in this case was, what kind of place is this neighborhood and how it was going to be destroyed by the facility itself. Another example of justice-driven research is the phenomenon we might call coerced residential churn. <clears throat> the idea that urban change itself, while of course urban cities always change, this is an ine uh, a inevitable process, but is almost <laughs> invariably more disruptive to some people's lives than to others. And mainly because the drivers of change are, of change are based on the interests of some more than others. And so the example here, the quote there, uh, it's from my work on gentrification in a neighborhood called Parkdale in Toronto. But it encompasses much wider processes of urbanization, suburbanization, urban nature, and discourses of sustainability. All of these can be uh, equally illustrative as examples of the voices of people who've expressed for years their angst and anger, but also their hope and resilience in the face of the loss of essential resources and supports, or the ne inevitable next move in the face of rising costs little power in an urban political economy that has become so heavily dependent on the revenues generated from the creative destruction of its own land base. That photo there, I took that photo, it's a, a bank advertisement that in Parkdale, which shows the, the uh, enthusiastic entrepreneur giving some life back to, to the neighborhood. A third focus for justice-driven research goes beyond places to encompass the many ways that unjust urbanization so insidiously affects people's lives. Here again we see uh, we need research that drills deeper than just looking at the air that we breathe as a determinant of our, <coughs> excuse me, of our lung capacity or the quantity of green space that we have in cities as a determinant of physical activity, as important as these kinds of questions are. In very real ways, place-based stigma of derelict environments that attaches itself to the bodies of young urban inhabitants can dictate their social geographies and life trajectories. So the two examples here, a photo on the left and just a little quote on the right, are taken from research that was undertaken by a former student of mine, Emily Skinner. She used a unique method called critical hip-hop as a research approach to investigate urban environmental justice in Winnipeg. So the two examples, one is of youth art, a graffiti mural, and the other is uh, the perspective of a hip-hop dancer, both of which convey how First Nations teenagers feel that their bodies have been marked by the disdain of Winnipeggers toward the racialized North End ghetto. And having lived in Winnipeg for five years myself, I can attest to the extent to which Winnipeggers are famous for conflating native people with North End people, the place where they belong, the place where bad things happen, and thus the place where there are bad people. And when such, when such bodies transgress the places where they belong, such as downtown Winnipeg, there is a great deal of gnashing of teeth amongst the affluent classes about the specter of allowing such people to occupy such spaces all of which has given rise to an endless litany of downtown revitalization schemes aimed squarely at cleaning up the mess. Finally, in the area of urban environmental justice research that's really stuck in my gullet in recent times <coughs> is the deficit fix of researchers, policy makers, and the media when it comes to defining and prescribing actions for urban problems. And here I take fix to mean two things. First, the fixed focus on painting pictures of derelict landscapes of the city, as in this article that was published in the Globe and Mail in the lead-up to the 2010 Winter Olympics. But I also implicate all forms of deprivation mapping. And this is my own discipline in geography that's complicit here. The quantification and spatialization of concentrated poverty in general, however measured, is fundamentally lacking a justice perspective. The reason why I think such research can be unjust, even when much of it is done to support claims of justice, of injustice, is that it invariably evades scrutiny of the sources of deprivation that may be measured in other ways, in other places, including the neighborhoods that are deemed unproblematic in their affluence 
and their positive environmental features, as well as in the policy spaces where decisions are taken that perpetuate or exacerbate the severity of deprivation. The second deficit fix is the focus on fixing. Fixing problems that are really just symptoms of problems. Fixing the red blobs that we see on the inevitable map showing social inequality in cities. Rather than attempting to indict unjust urban trajectories, such as growing socioeconomic inequality, increasing living costs, and decreasing quality of life. So justice-driven research can reassert a relational view of the city, focusing less on the enumeration and isolation of problems, and more on the inhabitation of the city, less on blaming victims, and more on shaming those who contribute to making the city less inhabitable. <coughs> so, <coughs> to take a provocative example, the idea that an urban green space such as the amazing new multi-dimensional playgrounds that have just been built in Winnipeg in the last few years. These, well, phenomenal uh, urban assets can be seen almost counterintuitively and quite paradoxically to be examples of possible environmental injustice. And I'll be clear, in and of themselves, these play spaces are phenomenal places for kids to go. I took my son there many times and, and, and love it. I miss it now that I'm not there. But the question about justice becomes evident when we look at where these playgrounds are, who benefits by, uh, from them by virtue of that location, and by virtue of who can get to them conveniently in when the context of Winnipeg's trans public transit system, and crucially and perhaps most importantly, the whiteness of such spaces, both visibly in being there and in the kinds of taken-for-granted assumptions about what play spaces should look like. And so with this provocation as a cue, I propose, a quote below, justice-driven research can and should focus on helping to make sense of the urban experience. And by this I mean defragmenting the myriad deprivations associated with urban life and making sense of how such deprivations come to be rationalized. It provides a common frame, the city as home, through which to coalesce research and advocacy efforts to challenge common root causes of such deprivations, not just their effects on narrow health outcomes. And if we can agree on this, then we can move forward with perhaps a more empirically focused demonstration of the research that I've been undertaking in the last few years with some of the colleagues that uh, I've cited above. And I'll do a time check because I have no sense of time at the moment. We so I've gone for 45. Mm -hmm. I might curtail some of my empirical stuff uh, to get to the end, but we'll see how we do. So this was a series of projects undertaken roughly between 20, 2007 and 2012 in three cities in which I lived while I studied as a postdoc at uh, a, a number of universities. I won't say how many or which ones. And then as a faculty member in, in Winnipeg. photo represents both the methodology of the research photography, as well as its setting. The photo of razor wire represents a typical scene in the downtown east side in Vancouver at the time that I did this research. <coughs> and when you think about it, razor is kind of a funny thing to put in a city. Its presence is a testament to the failure of more conventional measures uh, to script the casual geographies of urban people. Things like science don't go there. Razor wire lends insight into the severity of the problem. The idea that we need to take such drastic measures to protect our property from our fellow urban citizens in the same way that our ancestors have protected their trench lines from the enemy. It is as though we are anticipating an urban assault, which is a funny irony, which I'll come back to at the end of my talk. And of course, these days in the downtown east side, for those of you that go to Vancouver from time to time, there's a lot less razor wire in the neighborhood than in previous years. The vagrants are more likely to be dissuaded from entering premises by the $15 price of a pint of beer and the $25 clay of the pizza. I find it appropriate to put acknowledgments first uh, in this uh, talk about my research to give a sense uh, both of the great deal of human effort 
that goes into justice-driven research, but also to the great extent to which the idea of environmental justice can indeed resonate widely in the community of this number of organizations that got involved in this research along the way. The series of projects were run on a relatively small shoestring budget, but nonetheless involved community members hired as research liaison, students working as project coordinators, and researchers spread across three universities and, and cities. But it's relied mainly on the goodwill and in-kind support of countless individuals and organizations in these communities, each of which played roles in facilitating the research and in taking on board the findings. Uh, <clears throat> so we worked through a participatory ethos in this work, leaning heavily on some of the partners that I listed, mainly in Vancouver, uh, the Downtown Eastside Neighborhood House in Winnipeg, Circle of Life Thunderbird House, and in Toronto, uh, Ecu Home and St. Christopher House. And on the right here is our aim, which was rather lofty, to develop a methodology that can disrupt by refocusing, scaling, and destigmatizing conventional ways of knowing about inner cities. <coughs> and our approach was actually relatively straightforward. In each city, we would observe neighborhoods, then we'd compare them, and we'd ask questions about any observed differences in order to come up with some suggestions for how to go about justice-driven action, a modest effort to inform the response as an approach to environmental justice in my first slide. Our impetus was to find an alternative explanation for urban deprivation that goes beyond the map, at least in a conventional sense. And we did this in two parts. First, we would emulate a typical process of mapping in a way that allows the easy visualization, the typical visualization of deprivation in the city. And our maps would achieve what is typically achieved in deprivation mapping. Uh, we would confirm that there is a social gradient in the city. That's not a hard thing to do. We would paint a red blob on a map in order to isolate the problem. And this mapping would lend support to the idea that perhaps the red blob is the problem. But then in part two, rather than taking the map for what it is as a representation of deprivation and justifying that its utility by superimposing data about various measures of morbidity or mortality, our purpose in the second part of the project was to take back the map and subject it not to statistical regression, but to a process of investigative and comparative photography, a form of visually enhanced neighborhood assessment that is designed to give meaning to the different shaded areas on the map by directly observing what's going on underneath each of those shaded gradients, taking that relational view and framing the problem of socio-spatial inequality, and then proposing ways that we might intervene differently to address them. So part one, I'll just breeze through very quickly. It was a very typical approach, and I'll skip to right to the maps. And there you have the red blob in Vancouver, for those of you that recognize that geography, which is in the north part of the city itself, centered around the Strathcona area in the downtown east side. And just the, the black shaded areas, are, which I'll get to, are the areas where we visited. Uh, to do that investigative photography. And there, for those of you that know Winnipeg, is the classic uh, depiction of the de de urban deprivation in Winnipeg. It looks very similar to many, many other maps that I have seen. And here's our map of Toronto. And I just zoom in there because the focus in Toronto was in Parkdale, which is on the upper right, in relation to uh, uh, Bloor Street West, basically, and then Long Branch in Etobicoke. So, but part two is the interesting part, and this is the vast majority of the work, which is an adaptation of, of the widely used uh, technique in research called photo voice. Our approach, though, is a little bit different. We use three principles. First is collective. So, just to try to explain this very simply, we had groups of 15 community residents who became researchers in the project, and they broke down into teams of three to five people. We had discussions about environmental justice, um, and training workshops in how to do, go about investigative photography. <coughs> we did <coughs> then a comparative inquiry. So each, each team, and so remember there were three cities, and so three teams of five in each city, 
about 45 people in total, uh, selected from those maps three neighborhoods to assess their own neighborhood, which in Vancouver, for example, was the downtown east side, they were all residents of that neighborhood. Then they picked two other neighborhoods, and we tried to capture the full breadth of socioeconomic, uh, the shaded areas on the map. And then we set out, usually by bus, but sometimes on foot, uh, visiting the neighborhoods. We'd meet at a local coffee shop or a picnic table, and we would plot our, our routes and our strategies for assessing the neighborhood. And then we'd venture out, sometimes as a group, sometimes uh, uh, in, as individuals. <coughs> and then finally, following this notion of prolonged inquiry, after the visits, they would, we'd typically be in a neighborhood for two to four hours. We reconvened at a, at a meeting place for a debrief, and the photos were uploaded, and interesting insights and experiences were reviewed and discussed. After all three of the neighborhood visits were completed, the researchers were asked to reflect on all of the photographs that they took on their own time, and then to select, and when possible, write a caption for those photos that they felt most closely or profoundly represented what they wanted to say about their observations and their assessments of these places in relation to each other. And after a period of a couple of weeks, we interviewed them individually and gave them the opportunity to flesh out their ideas. And then finally we met as a group with all of the researchers together. And then at this meeting we collected and numbered all of the photographs and laid them out on tables. And then as a group we organized those photos into themes on the basis of the captions and the discussions. <coughs> and then we talked about those themes and what uh, you know, with, a, with, a, with an emphasis on ascertaining why are things this way when we look at these neighborhoods in relation to each other. And so I'll just uh, broach some of those now, but just very quickly, this is a, you know, I'm going to be able to read that, but that's okay. This is just a table that shows the diversity that, uh, of these research teams that reflect the diversity of these neighborhoods, which are often typecast as very homogeneous. Uh, we had a full spectrum of, of uh, age and gender, income from people on fixed income to people, you know, professionals, uh, the full range of education, and so on. So what did all this achieve? The first thing to confirm is the value of participatory approaches in justice-driven research. This researcher in Vancouver captured the sentiment. He said, one thing I noticed about this that if I walked around some of these neighbors on my own, I don't think I would have got the same thing out of it. Walking around with all of you, I'm hearing what you thought about the neighborhoods really adds to the process. The ability to do research is one response that was achieved in prompting environmental justice action. More than just being the objects to be consulted, participatory approach transformed these typically researched people into researchers themselves. It didn't take long for them to realize what power this gave them. This researcher from Toronto gave us a sense of the power of seeing better. He said, I have a better understanding. My eyes are open wider when I'm looking around. It doesn't matter what neighborhood I'm going to now. I'm looking past the storefront. I'm looking at the people, the conditions of the stores, and that sort of thing. I just find myself more open and just being more aware of the different neighborhoods and the different cultures there as well. Some observations that they made. This is my favorite because I, not just because I like beer, but because I can see myself so readily in the indictment of this person. I'm sorry, the font is a little small there. I'll read it in a moment. Uh, the vilification of alcohol consumption was a point of contention among Vancouver's team in particular. Local watering holes that you see in the bottom picture here at the Empress Hotel were seen as typical representations of this sort of hidden from view ethos that forced them to drink in dark bars with tinted windows. To use alcohol in the streets was to invite police scrutiny and possible arrest. But in other parts of the city, like this pub in Kitsilano, and certainly with the arrival of all the new bars alongside the gentrification that's come to the downtown east side, have come diners who feel perfectly justified in drinking beer out on patios right in front of local inhabitants, themselves behind the safe screen of a patio fence. And this person remarked, that's how they should be, like out in the open, in the fresh air, because we're paying the same price for alcohol here as they are in that place, so why can't we have a place like that? 
But we might ask, how is this possibly environmental? Let's be reminded of what it would be like if our public behavior were incessantly scrutinized and objected to, even within the confines of our own homes and neighborhoods. Put another way, put another way the next time you're enjoying a drink and some fresh air on a patio on Hastings Street or in the Exchange District in Winnipeg or on Queen Street in Toronto, imagine the privilege that comes with that beer and your ability to drink it in public with impunity even while in the midst of a neighborhood where people's lives have been so massively impacted by substance use, whether by their own addictions or that of their family members. Next, imagine just how absurd it would be, it would seem to most people, if a patio were to be erected outside of an establishment like the Empress Bar, where the beer is still 99 cents and consumed out of 8 ounce glasses. This is not exactly the street aesthetic that planners would conjure up in a typical design vignette. I'll try to get through a couple more and then I'll skip to the end. <coughs> this is a good one. So this theme depicts, suggests how public perceptions about neighborhoods seem to translate into behaviors in them. So this is certainly the case for public behavior in general. It's, it's not okay to be shirtless and lying on a bench in the downtown east side, but it is okay to be shirtless and slumbering on the grass on Sunset Beach. But an interesting finding that cut across all three cities was how behaviors differed even in routine practices such as sanitation. The quote here is from Winnipeg, but it could just as easily have been from Toronto or, or Vancouver. They said, look at that overflowing dumpster. So we actually have photos from, uh, from Toronto here and Winnipeg. It attracts rats, raccoons, squirrels. The kids have to play right next to all that garbage, and who knows what is in there. Whereas in the wealthy neighborhoods, which they visited, drivers even pick up the garbage that falls out of the bins. So their observations not only lend insight into how their neighborhood was treated by municipal sanitation workers, it also allowed them to explore how such treatment may be representative of a more deeply rooted problem where dereliction is blamed on the community, but actually produced by those from the outside out of their carelessness or lack of understanding both the everyday realities of residential churn and its effect on dumpsters. So fundamentally, these perspectives demonstrate the extent to which notions of environment, at least in the sense of something that has some kind of quality, seems to be restricted to better looking and more affluent neighborhoods. A healthy environment is necessarily a middle class environment. The idea of environmental value extends to the ways in which public investments are made in urban spaces. Again, in all three cities, benches were emblematic of a general disdain for inner cities. In all three cities, researchers could recount instances where benches had been removed from their neighborhoods, ostensibly because they posed too many problems of ill-mannered people disrupting the streets with their poor behavior. <coughs> in Parkdale, one researcher pointed out how such policies simply move people into more precarious spaces in order to sit down and relax and socialize. They took a photo of a popular congregation spot in one back alley, the photo on the right here. She suggested that instead of sweeping problems away, we should put benches everywhere and see what our problems are, and then work out a solution. Because getting rid of a bench just forces people into the alleys. It doesn't solve anything except for saying, not in my space. So, a smattering of examples of the outputs of justice-driven research in mind, I'll try to put up, pull off a sort of an abrupt segue back to the question of, so what can environmental justice do for cities and how we uh, intervene in them? <coughs> As a sort of self-congratulatory first level, I think our own efforts provide some positive implications for adopting environmental justice as a lens in research. We have the methodol methodological advantage of moving assessment beyond that deficit fix towards a collective and investigative technique of looking at the city. Conceptually, we may be encouraged to move, uh, to reroute the root causes of injustice in places and processes that have previously been given a free pass. And practically, environmental justice research can prompt direct community action, which is the final point of my talk. 
So here I'll take the risk of putting up another straw man argument of sorts. This one looks a little bit more like a cake. And the idea I want to convey is the injustice of baking cakes. That is the image that I see of city building in general, urban planning for example, is somehow akin to baking a better cake. A little bit of icing here to cover up the imperfection. Some decorations there to lend a cool brand to a particular neighborhood. And of course we need planners and we need progressively minded developers and construction workers and public health nurses, social workers, and even researchers to help us to make cities a better place to live. <coughs> but what justice-driven research demands of us is that cake baking, while a useful thing, is often ill-equipped to resolve questions of justice, which run much deeper into the social contract that we've all signed onto as Canadians and as urban dwellers. The reality is that whether researchers or planners or activists, we often find ourselves showing up with baking pans to what is essentially a gunfight. You need not be an orthodox Marxist to realize the many appropriations of our homes, communities, and broader living environments by the interests of capital is nothing less than a class assault on the city, on our home. And it's not being orchestrated by planners or the police or public health officials. These folks are often on the front line and they work very hard, but often are informed by incomplete theories. One example that I gave earlier is, is this notion of communicative or participatory decision making. The ones holding the guns are all those who cling to a singular interest, making our homes more profitable for them, to the exclusion of keeping the city inhabitable for those of us who already live here. The prescriptions that we de derive, and there are many, social mix, social enterprise, microcredit loans, heritage protection, and so on and so on. <coughs> All of these may amount to little more than band-aids to cover up the skin need, but that end up acceding to the entrepreneurial branding dreams of elite and often non-resident urban interests. The interest is as evident in the uprooting of low-income communities as it is in my next mortgage payment. It's as evident on the maps of food deserts as it is in the wholesale reconstruction of an urban image that is based less on our desire to raise and educate our families and more on our desires to emulate a lifestyle that we see on culinary and home decor spectacles on reality TV. <coughs> and when it comes to the production of environmental injustice, here's the real dig. We need not conjure up villainous mega-developers and the politicians in their pockets to blame them. For inceding to, an, inceding to an agenda in which we enmesh ourselves into the commodification of our own homes and our own urban lives, we become the perpetrators of injustice against ourselves mm -hmm. and our fellow urban inhabitants. And here's a quote from blogger Ga uh, uh, Gavin Mueller, who's a, a student uh, in Washington, DC, and he wrote this gem about gentrification in DC. He says, racism <coughs> isn't just a bad feeling in your heart, as a liberal believes when she insists that she is not all that racist, or she's not at all racist. It's a force that emerges from the pressures of maintaining one's own position and the resentments that spring forth from this process. It produces fear and hatred of the poor for being poor, for having any pretense of being on equal footing with the property there's a hatred for the potential threat to property values which underpin a tenuous future among the professional middle class. And that could easily, as easily apply in many Canadian cities as it does to Washington, D.C. <coughs> so short of guns, which I'm not advocating that people do, uh, despite the imagery I, I've presented, what can we bring to the gunfight? And rather than giving you my own opinion, which I'm always happy to do, we can look to those who've been on the front lines for quite some time to give us their suggestions. So from the research that we did over the course of a few years, we also concluded these with a series of workshops held in all three cities. And we brought these communities together to have a discussion about what to do about environmental injustice. And this is the, uh, an abbreviated list that I'm not going to go through all nine of them. But just to give you a flavor, maybe I'll read a few. The idea of justice in the city, or a just city, is a unifying framework that I've been arguing for. A framework for all forms of urban activism. We can get behind the idea of protecting our homes, 
So the prospect is simply to remind ourselves that home does not end at our doorstep. Number five, I think, is an important one, particularly for those of us that work in the field of health. Question empowerment. We have to be careful about this term. Inner city communities, low income communities, are already overburdened by a litany of institutional measures that appear to punish people for being poor. In the context of this uncooperative institutional framework, empowerment initiatives can be seen by community members as a gilded way of dumping onto overburdened communities the work of those who are jurisdictionally responsible for and endowed with resources to maintain healthy neighborhoods. Uh, scaling up, uh, I'll pick that one as a geographer, I like the, the concept of scale. The more affluent classes need to be part of the conversation about how they are implicated in and themselves affected by systemic injustice in the city. The comprehension of social relations beyond the disaffecting lens of inner city problems might convince a broader coalition of interests to consider the possibility of finding common goals. I'll stop there. There's a full report that is on uh, my website that you can easily find on YouTube if you're interested to read it. Uh, and uh, I'll just end with the, some of the references of the published work that's informed the talk that I've given tonight. by this relationship um, that you put out there between kind of art and policy and I'm wondering if you could speak to maybe where you end up a little bit at the end in terms of how um, these kind of artistic interactions with your photography and other um, kind of collaborative initiatives, how they can maybe inform policy making and if you can potentially highlight some successes of policy. Um, and I guess the motivation behind my question is that uh, I was encouraged to see the photo of Amjong, which is a place I lived for two years doing my own PhD uh, field work. Right before, uh, I left right before I don't know where it started. And um, I think that I left feeling quite unhopeful about the situation and unhopeful about the opportunities for art to kind of intervene and impact policy. So I'd love to hear some um, success stories. So uh, maybe if you could just expand a little bit on that. Um, and I was also curious if um, in your work around um, equity, if you've come across any um, sort of literature or insights around the relationship between mental health and um, environmental justice frameworks. And um, I guess the reason for that question as well as um, one of the activists, who I'm pretty sure was in this photograph, called me recently um, on a pass in the hospital saying, you know, I'm really curious about um, the relationship between sort of chemicals and um, environmental injustice. And it's interesting as a community engaged researcher, when you leave the field, I realize that the field never leaves you, and I'm wondering how you can go with mm -hmm. that boundary as well. Couldn't hear over here. Okay, <laughs> I'll summarize. So, how useful is art as a form of research uh, and as a, form, as a way of knowing to help uh, to make better, more inclusive, perhaps more just policies? Do I have any examples of success mm -hmm. in that uh, realm? Uh, I will say a qualified yes. I probably have more examples where art tends to get co-opted into things where that probably do more harm than good, uh, despite best intentions, sort of beautification schemes and whatnot, and sort of enrollment of youth in mural painting and so on that, uh, that tends to you know, employ some kids for the summer, but ultimately does little to address the issues. Uh, art is a research methodology, though, something that's definitely gaining traction, uh, generally speaking, and something that I've been using in my own work. And the example of my student in Winnipeg who worked for a very effective organization called the Graffiti Art Program. Uh, and in her project, she basically benefited from the, uh, partnering with that organization and their uh, honorary figurehead is uh, Mikhail Jean, the former Governor General. So she lent a lot of legitimacy to the, to the work that they did. Uh, and at the end of that project, in which 
about eight or nine youth that lived in the North End got to use whatever medium of communication that they preferred. And so you saw hip hop dancing and graffiti and photography and everything else. They got to perform those projects uh, in front of lots of VIPs in the city by virtue of the fact that Mikhail Jean was there in town and watching as well. Uh, and so that has gone a long way. And I, I mean, I'm not going to draw a causal link, but if I had to name any municipality where, where notions of equity and justice have made their way into the ways in which their systems, their public health systems and other systems are, are working, Winnipeg stands out as a very good example.